text on it. But the project grew a bit over the years, since 2009, when I started working with uh, Dr. Stuart Smith, who is now at the um, University of Tasmania in Launceston, setting up a new institute for um, design and development of technology for the elderly. Um, but he's, he's more or less the reason I'm in here, and I'm here. So I'm very grateful to Mr. Stewart. We still collaborate. <coughs> and over the years, a number of people have worked with us on these projects. And some of them still work with us. They don't want to leave, like Michelle Pickwell, um, who did her uh, final bachelor project in industrial design on one of our projects, and then uh, carried on as a master's student whilst having a job at Stanford Interactive. Uh, Victor, who's back in the Netherlands, doing his master's in industrial design in Eindhoven. Uh, physiotherapist, industrial design uh, colleagues of mine, and um, he, over the years collected a little bit of funding, not a lot, but I'm good at getting far with very little money. And you would think um, that's a good thing, but not always. Um, but yeah, you can judge for yourself. But we brought some of the stuff that we've been working on. So over the years, I think my um, realization was that developing interactive rehabilitation tools is all about motivating the patients and those involved, customizing so that they uh, can be individualized for each individual's needs which standard technology absolutely resists doing, which as a technical person I find insane. Uh, so that's a good one to get angry about. And to support people's independence, because we, we are very much tied to institutions, hospitals, um, um, clinics, other people that help us doing things that we could do ourselves. So I'm a bit of a Montessori background person. and. Um, I think it's just common sense. Uh, so I'll give some examples of that. First, um, a few examples of stuff that we've developed. We first started to um, um, hack game controllers to see, we, at that time we mainly worked with spinal cord injury patients, which are often young uh, guys who drove too fast on the motorcycle. And um, uh, so they know the idiom of the video game very well. So to support that, we developed a few things, um, and but we also found it very limited, so then we started to develop our own interfaces, so this is a, a, a unit that tracks people's motion and location, so you can do uh, goal reaching tasks in a certain order, that was with a group of, um, a mixed group of design students in 2010, and here's Michelle's uh, sleeve, and so that was a major project. That was the idea to have a whole bunch of sensors that you could wear as a as a patient, and you see a physiotherapist doing a lot of exercises. Actually, a very basic exercise of squeezing the thing, forefinger and the thumb together, and that's difficult for some people. This gives you a readout, and I'll come back to that a couple of times in my examples, because that's what these tools do and um, that's often all they need to do. Um, yeah, so Michelle will demonstrate her sleeve uh, after this, or, or even now. You didn't practice this. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Do you want to say something about this? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, as Bert sort of mentioned, uh, most of my research has been around having stroke patients. Um, and so a lot of the stroke patients that, that I was sort of interacting with in the hospitals were, were really doing very, very simple exercises and they weren't getting, unless they were sort of having one-on-one -on -one sessions with their physios, which with the physios being sort of screwed around between five patients at a time, they weren't getting the feedback they needed and it was, it was really simple feedback. Like, like you're doing it, you're holding your wrist in the wrong way, or or you you've slipped your wrist back into your old habits, kind of thing. So, um, what what I saw as sort of a, a big area that needed help was was allowing these patients to get that feedback without the physio have to, having to be by their side. So I thought by integrating sort of sensors that, that then sort of 
told them where they were doing things correctly and where they were doing it incorrectly would help them as well as sort of motivating them to um, to do more repetitions and things like that. So a very simple interface here, which, um, which was looking at that sort of um, that exercise where you, you're just sort of trying to to touch um, the computer. <laughs> Your computers from work. It's not working. Um, yeah, so the, the idea of, of this very simple exercise is that you've, you're you trying to touch what you call your forefinger to start with against your thumb. So a lot of patients can only get sort of tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of pressure and the idea is to, to get to that level of pressure that you or I have for all your different fingers. So um, what we were able to do here was just be able to show patients how much pressure they were getting and the, and they, the aim was to sort of get as much pressure um, as would be shown on the graph. Now, what's not showing, because again, my new technology is not working for me, is that there are lots of areas where, in a simple exercise like that, where a patient can go wrong. One of which is, is using sort of the wrist to then, and twisting the wrist to get the fingers to touch instead of actually using the muscles within the fingers. And so things like having a, a pressure sensor sort of on the wrist to tell them that, that they have sort of started putting pressure and, and twisting the wrist, wrist was able to, to tell them that, hey, you're not doing the exercise correctly. You need to, to be using your finger muscles instead. Um, so sort of from, from the bits of testing we did within the hospital and from all the physio feedback, um, everyone was really positive about it. But as, as everything does, there's a lot more work to be done on it to to get it really sort of... That's why we made you come back. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need to do okay, the I'll pass back to Bert. <laughs> yeah, no, when I saw you with it the Sunday, I got reminded that I've got one too. Um, I had a fall with my bicycle the other day, and luckily I didn't have a spinal cord injury, but I just broke my collarbone. Oh. Now I've got um, uh, a few screws in my body. Mm -hmm. And, and, a, and a rehab sleeve. So it's funny to <laughs> suddenly become... Um, an expert in your own interface. Um, but maybe I should first say something about my background because I'm not hindered by a design background. I've never been trained. <laughs> so I've never been told that I can make all these things and don't need to ask anybody whether it's a good idea or not. So I don't have much of an ego developed over the years. So my first background is actually in engineering. So I was always always a bit of a sissy engineer who would talk to people and ask them what they want and make soft things rather than hard and sharp things and even working with fabric and textile artists um, and um, yeah, uh, working with people, developing technology and I think that's a good definition of design and the irony is now that I work in the last six, seven years I work in, totally in a design school with all the design disciplines, and I have to, oh, this is going to be put on the, on the web. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's what you say. Yeah, mm. you have to edit that. Um, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we did was actually, spend every, and not the first thing, still the last thing, we keep going to the ward and observing how people do things. So I was struck by all these low tech, you know, using rubber bands, Velcro, styrofoam cups, Bad for the environment, good for exercises, because if you hold them and you squeeze the heart trying to not drop them, you, you crush it. So, from an interaction point of view, that's a, quite an elaborate interactive system. But it has, of course, limits. You can't change any of the parameters. So we started to look at this, and then a number of these things we started to try to what I call interactivate. So it's the same mechanical... Um, practice-driven approach, but then with sensors and actuators integrated, and hopefully in the same way of common sense. So here's a, a sensor they use, which is a pressure sensor for measuring uh, blood pressure, but if you put it on the, on the leg, you can measure pushing down. So we've got a very nice sensor on uh, Michelle's glove that does the same thing. Um, so I, can, I could just see that they were already experimenting with this stuff. Um, so then, in the last years, we added a few more things. Um, the sensor floor that I'm demonstrating here, uh, Michelle's work with the more intimate and wearable controllers. 
uh, a, a proposal for a whole programming system so that um, physiotherapists and the practitioners and the carers don't need to learn pro computer programming, but they can program through the object. And looking at existing structures and trying to sort of instrument those so that they turn into um, a system that tracks behavior of the people. And this is also inspired by one of the earlier projects of Stuart Smith, again Stuart who uh, made a Dance Dance Revolution map for, for the elderly, because he studied that with the original DDR system and discovered that a lot of things were unclear. So he redesigned it in such a way that it was clear for, for that population. And that is still running in, the, um, in, in several physiotherapy wards around Sydney. He also found, um, anybody familiar with uh, Fruit Ninja? It was quite, a, quite addictive, but he found that the stroke patients who had to practice that, exactly that movement and wouldn't do it, give them this on an iPad and they won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple and, and uh, convincing demonstration of the power of the video game. And also the problem, because what he found was that if you said it, even if you said it's for the, for the slowest user, it's still too fast for some. So he approached the kids from half break in Brisbane who developed this game, and are probably very rich by now, um, and they were kind enough to, to change their own game to slow it down. And then the, the amount of people that can play it is much bigger. So it's a good example of customization. And one time when I was in the ward in Bankstown, I saw a patient practicing the two at the same time. I was saying, Chris, <laughs> you wouldn't have known until you give it to someone. So because they were there, they started doing that. <laughs> so taking that idea of the floor a bit further, um, there was this... Hmm. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and I have a degree in these things. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, I used to work for Philips in the Netherlands, so a lot of the reasons why I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Technology knows you. Yeah. yeah, so I'm, I'm actually advocating a more people driven and open technology. So I give you the bits, like Lego, and you make it for yourself. Mm. And I think people are perfectly capable of, of doing that. And there's a few systems now on the market, but it's still very limited. So in that modular fashion, um, Rebecca Hall, who did her final project in 2012, uh, she took, took on that idea and worked in that modular way. So she came up with this first version of the stepping uh, task thing. And I know for this, we stand on, because most of the industrial design models say, don't touch, it's a model. It might break. And she has do stand on. So, very good. <coughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <Very> good. <laughs> <laughs> this slide comes from another lecture. So the idea of using small pressure sensors, FSRs, that cost about $6.95 if you pay too much, you can actually take a, make a stepping sensor out of that. And I did that in an architectural project in 1997. Um, so I knew it was possible. Then I used uh, plywood and now we use 3D printing, so much cheaper. And also a little plug, uh, tomorrow Cas uh, Oosterhuis, one of the architects of that building, is doing a talk at UTS, and he's a very interesting and radical person because uh, he inspired me to think about design in a parametric way. So rather than you design one thing, you design more like a set of rules. And that's what we want to do with the sensor floor. They're now fixed sizes, but we want the customer to determine the, the, the parameters of the design and then 3D print it. And that's very much influenced by our size. So if you want to know more about that way of thinking, it's a very interesting uh, six o'clock at the design faculty. This is uh, Victor Donker, who was intern from uh, University of Eindhoven. He, um, and he wouldn't leave, so he did two semesters with me. And in the second semester, he worked mainly on the, on the new version of the floor and the graphical user interface that you see on the screen. So there's a bit of twister going on. 
does something. Come and play afterwards mm -hmm. and talk to yourself. Of course, we don't do so much of this work in, in my studio. This is where we learn and where we bring the thing almost every week and get feedback and try to develop it. We never thought the people with thesis stepping on it. And most of the time it works out, so I think we listen well to the, um, to the audience. Here's another <coughs> unexpected um, use to put it on the tail table. And this was an interesting case study because this patient was actually very problematic, had very little uh, power in his, uh, in his limbs and any other physical problems. And he wouldn't push up, but Oh, the physiotherapist, he knew he could do it. And this is the most motivating physiotherapist I've ever seen. He's a complete um, uh, power guy. He wouldn't do it. And then we held up the, with the sensor, we held up the, the feedback. The patient saw what he was doing himself. And then he, then he believed it. And he started pushing. Yeah, maybe it was only three grams, but he did it. And that gave Carl something to work from. And that tiny bit of difference, I think that's um, also in Michelle's work in the really intimate and small movements, that's where it begins and that's where we can start to work from. Just giving plain feedback. Um, this is the word in, um, in Adelaide. We work with them, they do a com comparative study between these kinds of tools. Um, and this is me getting some experience in how this works. Uh, we also found that this um, only present item is the hand cow counter. Who can catch one? Yeah. And another one? Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, so we did many shape studies, and in the end, uh, this is sort of the shape that came out of it. Just counting. And here again, we found an interesting thing that the electronic counter that we make is much brighter, much clearer, much more engaging, so people are much happier to use them. But they can also read it. So we spent years in the ward talking about these mechanical hand counters. Only when we made our own, the staff told us, yes, actually, the mechanical ones, most patients can't read them. They never told us that. So the only reason why they told us because we brought something in. So in addition to, I think, general participatory design, you, you need to, sometimes be bold and, and intervene and then see what feedback you get. Um, this thing is not just a counter, it's also wirelessly connected to the system, so the system would lock in real time people's, um, people's development. And that goes with this uh, programming thing that we made based on RFID tags, so the, um, the practitioner can set up an exercise and that all gets logged, including the data. Um, this is us building the thing. We were trying to design it in such a way that it is easy to build. And I spent about half a day uh, in total soldering everything together. Too much work. So I'm trying to design out myself in the next version. And this we really looking proud. Oh, I'm getting into the, um, in the UTS um, uh, video, promo video. There's a couple of seconds of us. And uh, this is how. Uh, so the core of it is 3D printed, costs about 80 bucks to get done, and the rest is um, acrylic, all cheap materials. Here's the core. So that means that we can have different sizes eventually and have them online. So there's a company, um, ironically, in the Netherlands that um, prints on demand like you do with books or your, your um, holiday uh, albums. So you can also print things on the mount. And I think that's very exciting because that means that what we, the business model that we're trying to develop is that we won't touch these things anymore. So if you want one of those floors, you go online, you order the different parts to your specification, that the parameters of which we set, and you build your own thing. And hopefully pay us a bit of money so that I can keep doing my research. But I don't need to I don't need to manufacture. They can do that much better. <coughs> um, and another plug is um, in Object Gallery there's an uh, exhibition going on at the moment, sort of an open participatory exhibition about printing on the web. 
from jewelry perspective. And this is the last version that was being, has been re redesigned by four mechanical engineering students. And I'm going to end with this, these these three things because I think these are the after um, all those years these are the key things for me. And anyone who wants to give me feedback on that and um, wants to add to this, I'll be very grateful for. It. Yeah, is that a strange way to end? No, <laughs> <it's very cute. laughs>